uh, thank you for agreeing to share your work with us uh, and thank you everyone for joining us today um, and uh, Mia uh, is a first year PhD candidate at, uh, at our department um, working on a more than human history of South Africa's National Zoolog Zoological Garden. Her project aims to investigate the changing ways animals experience cap cap captivity at the institution and the broader global trade network they formed part of. Uh, she was awarded the Oppenheimer Mem Memorial Trust uh, Local Scholarship to pursue this project. She has published research on animal performances in South Africa's circus industry, which formed part of her master's dissertation at uh, Stellenbosch. Um, okay, great. Mia, uh, you, know the, you know the rules, 30-35 uh, minutes, uh, and then we'll uh, open, it up, open the floor up to questions and comments. I will uh, just switch off my video and be ready whenever you are. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction and for encouraging me to come on here and present my, my research. Um, so the paper that I'm going to be discussing today is titled On the Trail of the Mercy Bullet, Caps and Barnard Harris and the First Animal Tranquilizing in Zululand, South Africa, from about 1927 to 1931. So just to briefly, as Ananda mentioned, um, just touch on my PhD research, which is the large project that this forms part of, where I am investigating a more than human history of the Pretoria Zoo, more widely known. Um, I'm interested in the ways that animals, the changing ways in which they were captured, transported, traded and exhibited, um, and what these changes then can tell us about the broader social political climate in South Africa and at large. And I'm also hoping that looking at the historical captive animal can allow new light um, to be shed on labor relations, on the production of scientific and zoological knowledge, um, as well as, as we've also mentioned, South Africa's role in the global animal trading network. Um, this paper is focused specifically on animal capturing, which, as I've said, forms part of the broader research of my project. Um, so this entire article started from a single document that I found in the archives in Pretoria, which is one of the amazing things about history, is that just one document can allow for an entire new historical investigation or a research rabbit hole, which is certainly what happened um, in my case. So this letter, which is a portion is shown on the slide, is a letter from the head of the defense. He's writing to the Secretary for the Interior, and this is in June 1928, He's wanting to find out more about um, a certain Captain Bernard Harris. Note the incorrect spelling here as it's significant. But this man has apparently been commissioned by the Pretoria Zoo to come to South Africa and capture wild animals painlessly by the means of a so-called mercy bullet. So he wanted to know more about this bullet, you know, how it functioned. Um, and I've seen no evidence as to if he ever received this information. But it was this letter that got me thinking about early methods of animal capturing, and obviously what I thought was to be the start of the tranquilizing, what we know is a wide movement and, and a used method today is the tranquilizer gun. Um, and so I started investigating a bit more about Captain Bernard Harris. Um, as my investigation started, I could find almost nothing written about him. And then I realized that it was the spelling that was stopping this. And so when I used Captain Barnard Harris, his name, I was able to find more primary sources to save and then look at, but nothing substantial had been written about what seems to have been the first tranquilizing gun. And so I started looking at the actual gun and the history of what we know to be the modern day tranquilizer gun. Um, and this is accredited to a very different person. Um, and this is a New Zealand vet and trained pharmacist called Colin Murdoch, which was only patented in the late 1950s. Um, he's a very interesting figure in his life. He has painted over 40 different inventions some of them very famous, the um, syringe, disposable syringe used, you know, for modern medicine, as well as the childproof safety cap for medical bottles. And of course, important for this article, the modern day tranquilizer gun, which is obviously, you know, New Zealand, a very, um, you know, was, was portrayed in their postal service. So it was something that they, the success was widely published. Um, and so looking at this disconnect between what I thought were earlier methods and what is known about the tranquilizer gun started off this historical investigation and has led me to be able to present this research to you today. 
Um, so the research is, or this paper is at a confluence of several bodies of historical knowledge. It functions as valuable sort of um, um, project to the field of STS, which we know is dynamic and constantly changing, as we can see by the recent publication, um, The Scientific Imagination in South Africa. Um, along with this, it also looks at a history of hunting as a prequel to capturing live animals for you know, zoos and other institutions, which of course started with John McKenzie, um, which sparked various historiographical debates about hunting practices in South Africa. Um, and um, along with this, this paper also looks at a history of national park science, veterinary science, um, pioneered by scholars like Jane Carruthers and Karen Brown. Um, so why looking at, um, you know, ACTS or object histories, why is it useful when thinking about the human animal divide or overcoming the human animal divide is due to the fact that ACTS aims to look at a human built world as an integrated whole. Um, looking at this from a multi-species lens, so destabilizes this idea of a human built world as something distinct. Um, and if we can look and think about how we have affected animals within you know, constructing this human built world and in similar ways how they too have affected our technological advancements is one of the ways to you know, overcome this divide and think between both these, these fields of history. Um, on top of that, ideas about wildness and wild things have been used by historians and continue to be salvaged um, as exciting concepts to help us think more about the human condition, about modernity and about human domination essential now more than ever if we are confronted by the devastating effects of climate change in the Anthropocene and our role within that. So this is the broader um, secondary literature that this article and my work draws from. Um, of course, also critical zoo history like Nigel Rothfels in the slide. Um, so the aim of this paper drawing from this extremely dense bodied work is to fill the glaring gap in our historical knowledge about the first use of a tranquilizer gun. It restores this lack using a variety of primary sources, like I showed you the letters of correspondence, newspaper articles, radio snippets, and scientific journals, which document the first experiments and Captain Barnard Harris's travels into South Africa. It argues that there are several plausible reasons as to why we've overlooked this contribution, but most likely was that it was overshadowed by the large scale game culling that took place in Zululand from the late 1920s. And this article will add to the growing body of animal history but is located within the field of SDS, arguably a field underutilized by animal historians. So to get back to the crux of this paper, it is useful to think about the changing ways animals were caught in history. We know that these are various methods as diverse as the people involved in catching animals who ranged from naturalists, explorers, local people using this as, as an opportunity um, and the methods involved were a variety of traps as can be seen by the pictures as well as pitfalls um, capturing large and um, capturing animals from large herds um, what was used was variety of hunt um, catchers on horseback would rush at the animals from all sides and the young or the weaker would obviously fall back from the herd and could then be seized this was obviously very useful for certain animal species but some like elephants and rhinos would not abandon their young and as a rule would often have to be killed first in order to be able to seize um, their young to be taken. Um, so these methods, which were obviously very destructive and bloody, were portrayed in popular press and books for most of the 19th century until Nigel Rothfels describes this change at the, at the turn of the 20th century where criticism arises about th these methods obviously tying into the start of anti-animal cruel, anti cruelty leagues and SPCA, and a new code of catching had to be developed at the turn of the 20th century um, as a response to this critique and also to the, to the professionalization of this field. And I argue that this created a niche for Harris to, to create his mercy bullets as this really ties into this new code. To understand a bit more about the mercy bullet, we have to look a little bit at the evolution of military technology. So we know in the late 1880s, the British army had adopted a rifle known as the Lee Mifroid or the Mark II. So this bullet was lighter with a longer range than previous bullets. 
despite the improvements, unless the burn or central organs were hit, this bullet was really ineffective in warfare. And so they started developing new types of ammunition, which were inspired by the types of ammunition used to hunt wild animals. And this allowed them to come up with what was known as the Mark III or the Dum Dum bullet, which is named after the Dum Dum arsenal near Kolkata in India, where it was first manufactured. These bullets, in contrast to the explosive bullets of the normi normal army, army um, arsenal, are expanding bullets. Um, so what this means is that coming into contact with bone, this bullet would then spread out and effectively tear and splinter everything before it. Um, the wound caused by this bullet was generally mortal and any limb would need amputation. It was adopted by the British Army during um, to be used in only colonial warfare against colonial savage warfare, that's how they described it, and not against any civilized enemies. Um, although they've stated this, it was heavily condemned by countries like France and Germany and eventually abandoned by Britain in 1902. So arguably criticism about the effects and the suffering caused by these types of bullets allowed new ways of thinking about pain and ammunition um, to form. And this allowed the first types of experiments of narcotic bullets to take place a little while later in the early 1900s. So this news was captured across the globe um, and it stated that in the United States, army officials had started developing a narcotic bullet where they were adding minute particles of morphine into the tiny wells of the steel jacket of a, normie, a normal army bullet. So in stark contrast to the dum dum bullet, this would cause no splintering when coming into contact with the bone and would only cause a slight flesh wound. So these reports stated that this could be used to in self-defense, to hunt big game, or importantly, during war. Um, arguably, it was meant to do away with the, the, you know, with the wounds that were agonizing troops um, and the suffering involved from troops dying from painful flesh wounds. Um, so interestingly, there's little evidence that this was ever used, obviously, at the start of World War I, but I argue this is the first type of bullet, you know, in with using drugs within, um, and that's sort of this building block that Harris used um, when expanding onto his, his method, um, which only comes much later in the 1920s. So Captain Barnett Harris and his mercy bullets, although absent from the historical record, makes sort of popular press headline news in the 1920s, 1927 to be exact. Um, and some of the pictures on the right show him, um, as well as the, his, his invention, which is obviously very different from a regular army bullet. So what he has created was termed a hypodermic needle, which carried chemicals at the base. So this needle would then be fired into the animal's skin, and this anesthetic drug would then um, filter into the animal's bloodstream and render them unconscious. Um, and it was stated that this was to be used to collect wild game um, in a pain-free and much calmer manner to be collected for zoos. Um, and he was apparently commissioned by the Chicago Zoological Society to come and experiment this new method in South Africa. Um, what is important about his, his method or his describing um, the descriptions of this, this method is the fact that he just terms it an anesthetic drug. Um, this is is vague and he doesn't ever mention exactly what this compound is made up, although he does call it a compound. We can presume that it must have been a combination of um, a neuromuscular blockade like Curair, which was later used, as well as a sleep inducing agent in order for it to combine and be useful to both put the animal to sleep as well as to effectively have no pain involved. Um, so Harris claimed that inquiries about this bullet came from across the globe and practically all countries. While we're not sure if that's true, it was captured in press, in global press, um, stating again, the nature of the bullet, which they say, you know, would cause unconsciousness in the animals, stating that he was coming from Chicago Zoological Society. And the, the, the two articles on the right were, capt were capturing his arrival in Durban, South Africa um, in 1928. What is important to mention before discussing his trip in South Africa is the challenges of following a paper trail, 
I spoke about the, the incorrect spelling of his name earlier. And here are just a few more examples of that um, bar at Burnett and even a Rennet at the bottom. Um, yeah, this just got me thinking, you know, about the challenges historians face. And although possibly small, this could also have played a role in us neglecting or overlooking his contribution. So while it was difficult to track, it is known and it, we know that his expedition in South Africa did arrive in June 1928. Um, the photo on the right is from a newspaper article in the New York Times published later once he returned home, but shows him alongside a Zulu tracker with an animal who has been rendered unconscious by his mercy bullet. It then had later revived and wandered away with that identification tag, which was just a cloth tied to its horns. So he arrived in June 1928 and spent time experimenting on the game of South Africa, especially in the Zululand region. Um, and it was successful on a variety of, of buck and antelope. And he did try and use it on a rhinoceros. And this is where the Pretoria Zoo comes in. So the Pretoria Zoo was desperate to have a rhinoceros in their collection, and up until that point had been really unsuccessful in obtaining one. Um, and they hoped that Harris would be the person to be able to help them do so. So he did use his bullet on a black, uh, white, a black rhinoceros female, and she then, um, experiencing the, the effects of the drugs, wandered off, leaving her baby um, alone. And they were able to capture it and then send it off to the Pretoria Zoo. Um, sadly, this young rhinoceros died on the way to the zoo, as was often the case when transporting wild animals, you know, without sufficient care. Um, arguably not great for Harris's success story, but it actually very little to do with the makeup of his bullet. But so that, those were the two sort of main events that took place while he was here. Um, what's interesting when we look at the success of his trip or the portrayal of the success, which was mainly captured in the US press when he returned, um, he also was involved in a variety of talks um, and radio hosting. So this, these notions of success were coming from obviously back home in the States. We know that in South Africa in the 1920s, um, we were involved in a, in a process of nation building where the achievements of local scientists were used to invoke national pride. Arguably, Harris could not contribute at all to the South Africanization of science. Um, one of the reasons why, of course, the United States were, were so quick to you know, proclaim his success. What is also important to note about the way that he was framed in these sources is the romanticism of the great white hunter, which he very much formed part of if we look at the way he's described. For example, in the bottom where it says, the only white man in the world to catch wild animals alive. So we know that this romanticism of white hunters, as well as animal catchers, um, risking their lives and conquering the perils of Africa had been, a, had been a trope used in imperial discourse since the late 1800s um, and helped entrench the idea of white masculinity and superiority um, and their domination over African people and landscapes. So this is important to note about the way that he was framed um, and the success story that was portrayed in the US. Um, in actual facts on the ground in South Africa, his trip was very short lived um, and the reasons for that will be explained. So in the region where Harris was conducting his experiments, we know that Zululand was being um, was being affected by the animal tribe tripinosmiasis disease, also known as Nagana. This had been causing destructive to the domestic livestock since the late 1800s, um, but it had arisen again and caused a lot of problems in the late 1920s when Barnard Harris arrived. Um, so a lot has been written about this disease and the control measures taken by the government. Um, but what's, what is important is the fact, um, for those who don't know, this disease is um, caused by a minute blood parasite that is um, transferred from infected game to livestock through the tsetse fly. So wild animals acted as hosts for this disease, but did not get sick in contrast to domestic livestock, who obviously, as you can see in the picture, became very ill and died, which was devastating to the agricultural sector, which was you know, extremely influential in South Africa's economy. So due to the fact that game were the hosts and, you know, weren't, weren't getting sick from this disease, 
allowed for a variety of campaigns to take place in order to try and eradicate Lingana from the area. One of the largest um, and most destructive campaigns taken place were the large scale eradication campaigns. So the big, the, this started off in 1920 of August, but was continuing when Harris arrived in South Africa. And this just meant the large scale slaughter of wild animals um, on numerous occasions controlled and proposed by the government. Um, so there was no consensus among the scientists as to if this was a worthy method of controlling Nagana especially not from these three men on the slide. So if we look on the left, this is Dr. Alvin Hagner, who was the director of the zoo at the time. In the middle is James Stevenson Hamilton, who was the warden of the Kruger National Park. Um, Carruthers has shown his transnational influence um, of conservationist ideas. Um, and on the right is Dr. Ernest Warren, who was the director of the Natal Museum. So these three men were in consensus together about the devastating effects of these eradication campaigns, obviously on the loss of, life, of the wild animals, but mainly they were concerned about the very little scientific backing or knowledge that um, allowed them to believe that these campaigns would actually work in controlling Nangana. For example, the fact that large game was being killed um, wouldn't be useful due to the fact that a lot of small wild animals also acted as hosts and therefore but the, the Nangana wouldn't be eradicated from the region. Um, but in contrast to the conservationists, the veterinary and entomology department viewed them as a threat to their primary function, which was to upkeep the health of the livestock sector. And therefore game eradication continued to be maintained as a, as a method worth upkeeping in the region. Um, Brooks has shown in detail how the Zululand game reserves were in constant threat of being abandoned due to the constant pressure by the farmers um, to continue with these eradication campaigns. Due to these campaigns, Harris's trip in South Africa only lasted a year, and he left very unhappily um, the following year in 1929. And he's quoted here on the left, he was very disappointed by the wasteful an unnecessary destruction of the game by hired gunmen who he claimed were not even good shots, the muddled and inefficient handling of the game reserves and the frittering away with cold indifference of one of South Africa's finest assets. And so his trip was cut short. Uh, he stated that he would be leaving to what is today modern day Tanzania um, and he left. Um, so we know that actually the starting of nature reserves in South Africa from the 1910 onwards were not you know, driven by any conservationist methods or by ideology, but rather were um, aimed at increasing the desirable species of game you know, to attract paying sportsmen to come and hunt. So in fact, um, Carruthers has shown that the sportsmen rather than conservation scientists were the ones lobbying for wildlife protection during this time. Um, although Harris likes to, to he was critiquing big game hunters who he said would know, just come to Africa, collect trophies. He actually formed part of that group of sportsmen who were lobbying for wildlife protection during this time in South Africa, um, where vet veterinary and entomology department was really trying to focus on eradicating livestock diseases. So this article argues that his trip was cut short and overshadowed by these um, eradication ca campaigns, allowing for us to have really little knowledge about the first use of a tranquilizer gun. Um, in the history, the tranquilizer gun is synonymous with the name Colin Murdoch. What is interesting about Murdoch and his patent is the ways in which he starts to think about tranquilizing only in the late 1950s. Um, this was during the time where he was um, studying the introduced wild goat, deer and tar populations in New Zealand he obviously realized that tranquilizing them first would be a lot easier to catch. Um, while he was not the first to realize this, he decided to start experimenting with drugs for specific species, as he argued that the types of drugs they, just, they were using, curare in the beginning stages, were leading to the death of animals because of their excessive physiological response to the drug um, after being darted. So he found, started working on drugs that were safer and more effective, arguably drawing from his um, background in, ph um, in pharmacology. Um, and he then also created a method of introducing an antidote for the tranquilizer as soon as possible to the, for the treated animal in order to reduce any kind of physiological response. 
Um, so it's very plausible that before this, Harris's method was certainly not as successful as he claimed it to be. Um, and this is evident if we look even as recent as the early 2000s, um, where we're still facing problems with tranquilizing and we're still making improvements to the tranquilizing drugs that we use um, today. Um, so Murdoch's method of antidote or tranquilizer and then antidote was actually adopted in South Africa in the 1960s, specifically when Ian Player, who was the senior ranger of the Mfalozi Game Reserve, um, undertook his large scale and widely known um, Operation Rhino, where they aimed to remove the white rhinoceroses from that region in order to preserve the species. So for this, they undertook and used his, his method. Um, and while Ian Player in his, um, in, the, in his biography written by Graham Linscott, they state that they achieved immobilization for rhinos, which was something you know, extremely new and great. He does mention Harris in this, in this article and says that um, while they had achieved this in the 1960s, they had been an American who had come to try and shoot a black rhinoceros with a mercy bullet covered with a curé substance. So that is a single sentence that Harris gets reduced to. Um, and this article just tries to reveal that his historical contribution to the te technological advancements of the modern day tranquilizer gun is perhaps not as significant, as insignificant as player suggests. And rather that we must acknowledge his complex role in the development of this gun um, and also how he formed part of the small group of hunters and conservationists who were lobbying for wildlife protection before the rise of mainstream conservation ideology, which was only from the 1960s onwards in South Africa. Um, just some concluding remarks. Um, this article has shown that the development of the drugs used for modern day tranquilizer guns actually develops or starts first in the 1913 with Alexandra Humphrey, the pattern maker in Pittsburgh but it was Captain Barnett Harris who took it further to develop his Mercy, Mercy Bullet, which was a hypodermic needle filled with a chemical compound aimed to knock an animal unconscious and render it a pain-free experience of capturing. He came to experiment on wild game in Zululand in 1928. And this article documents the first use of these methods, an essential part of history of technology and science, which up until now has been neglected. It does show the success of his trip as portrayed but questions the notion of this success, considering that this technique was only formally adapt adapted and used 30 years later. Um, this article argues for plausible reasons, various plausible reasons for this omission of his contribution. Firstly, it points out the frequent misspelling of his name across global sources, but more significantly, it argues that the success of his trip was cut short and overshadowed by the ongoing Nongan endemic and the destructive campaigns used to try and control the disease. Um, it also considers the fact that Harris's lack of ties to the union may too have caused his invention to have been overlooked, seeing that he could not have contributed to the South Africanization of science, which was being um, celebrated in the union in the 1920s. Overall, what this article does is opens up new doors of historical inquiry into the methods of animal um, capturing, um, and it has illustrated that looking at historical animals can bring to light new narratives about our collective past, which are relevant across historical disciplines and fields. Thanks so much for listening. Um, and I look forward to hearing your feedback. Thank you, Mia. Um, stop sharing. Yes, if you could just stop sharing. Thank you so much. Uh, and the floor is open. Thank you for uh, a very interesting paper. Can, and we can have, and sticking to the time, it's perfect, half an hour. Uh, we have quite a bit of time for discussion. Um, please, you can, uh, yes, I see Bodhi's hand. Please go ahead. Bodhi, then Monica. Bodhi, can you hear me? You can hello, hello, go ahead. Mia. Uh, yeah, very, very interesting paper, and thank you. I had a I, I'm not sure, but I thought that uh, it was very interesting, but I always knew Barnett Harris's uh, adventures more in Java and Borneo, which if I remember probably predates, I may be wrong, but my sense is it predates the African um, adventures. It should be somewhere in the mid twenties, uh, 
because it did definitely create an Asian base uh, for uh, these kind of stuff, which I remember, because it changed the um, it, it kind of there was a whole set of debates about elephant catching in Assam and Burma in 1925-27. It was this guy called Milroy. And I do think that they did notice Barnett Harris's method and uh, eventually, sorry, I, 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 I never pursued this as a, as a research topic, but I, what I do remember that uh, there was uh, some discussion of it, which if I'm not entirely uh, incorrect, which probably predates uh, his adventures in South Africa and elsewhere in Africa. So I can understand like this might be quite uh, central for your argument, but I, I would also kind of, I, I would just like to know if you have considered looking at his Southeast Asian uh, experiences, if, if it ever came up in the, in the sources you, because I definitely remember this as part of a kind of marginal, but discussions in, in forest and elephant catching departments. So that's just kind of one point. The other thing I'm, I'm thinking about is slightly larger because I'm not sure where you want to take this interesting discovery and and oh. um, and I'm 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 just trying to think a little bit about um, uh, kind of history of inventions which have uh, traveled uh, from particular quarters uh, and has to to other quarters of 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 torture, intimidation, violence. Um, and I'm thinking that in a, if we can, I, I can immediately think of a history from First World War, the invention of laughing gas uh, to this, uh, uh, the, uh, the kind of tranquilized tank gun. And then sometimes in 60s, 70s, the invention of taser and, and uh, stunner. Thing, uh, I just want to know a little bit about uh, if you have found any non-animal uh, uh, kind of uses, uh, references of, of any of that sort, uh, maybe not so much in the 30s, but uh, uh, what happens when Marduk patents it and whether this technique actually um, gets transferred from the animal domain uh, to mob violence and uh, disciplining riots? Is, is there some kind of conversation? Is something there? Uh, these are just two kind of uh, initial thoughts that uh, ran through my mind, uh, but uh, really enjoyed listening to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bertie. Um, on your first point, yes. Sorry, Mia, do you want to? OK, you've already started responding. You might as well. No, because there are two right. other questions. No, OK, okay. no, go ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. OK, thanks. Um, on your first question with regards to his his role in Java and Borneo in the newspaper articles they do mention that was areas that he also was going to travel to um, and then with regards to some other sources that I found um, and these are you know, um, documents located in um, in East Asia where they're corresponding between each other to ask if Captain Bonham Harris has arrived and, and has started conducting experiments and those sources seem to say that he hadn't yet or and hadn't done anything. Um, so I definitely need to look into that more, sort of what I was trying to find was leading to a lot of um, closed ends, but I can definitely see that there is something more there for me to look at, so thank you. Um, with regards to being used for um, humans, it's actually very, um, it's a very small and insignificant. Um, it was used in very, there's sort of three or four times it's mentioned in very arbitrary and not in any kind of sort of warfare cases. Um, so they mentioned that it could be used as a sort of self-defense. Um, and even those sort of instances are very rarely mentioned in, in text. So there wasn't a, a large translation from it being used for animals to, to then being a human um, method. So um, Thank thanks for Thank that. Monica, uh, hi, Monica, you, and after that, Lance, please go ahead. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much, Mia, for this discussion. Um, I am also working in a 
sort of similar uh, field. I'm working at the moment on the Przewalski horses and they have been traded a lot and tranquilized and <laughs> captured and so on. So a lot of what you say resonates and I I was very happy actually to hear you because I, I really knew the Murdoch story, right? That was the what I knew about the, the beginnings of tranquilization, right? So it, it was interesting. Um, and I have a few things. So one is co connected to um, the idea of researching the zoo. And that is quite remarkable because zoos these days are very sort of, um, from what I have um, tried to do in with zoos in Europe and in in the UK and the US, they are very protective, right? They don't, they are not very happy of researchers looking into their archives. Um, and some openly told me that they were happy that their archive actually flooded. And so, so that was one of the the issues I was wondering if you could talk more about, I would be interested to, to hear you talking a little bit more about this research at the zoo and how you gained access and how are they seeing you as a researcher and whether they are open and happy about you researching uh, their history. That's one, one point that is unrelated to the topic, but um, then one thing that was really interesting was how you contextualize the tranquilizer, um, the magic bullet in this context of conservation or practice uh, starting to be more attentive to the animals, right? And more attentive towards animal welfare and this uh, sort of rising idea of caring in a way. Um, and I thought that was interesting. And of course, that remains a controversial practice, right? Because it does involve violence and it's quite a paradoxical, ambiguous sort of practice. While you, you do care for the animal in a way, but you have to catch it, you have to handle. So that involves a certain violence and this sort of continuously perfecting of the of the, the the substance and so on um, is something that the dosage and that is a history that remains to be written that would be fantastic actually to um to write something maybe together at some point with what i've gained um from the horse but yeah so um as a concrete question. I was wondering whether you could trace, whether it, there is something to trace about a possible linkage between Bernard Harris and Murdoch. And while there might not be any direct link, maybe just within, you know, the, the context of conservationists, the context of, 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 and how these discussions traveled or the, you know, because they do uh, develop these things um, sort of independently, but not that independently. And what were the discussions that generated um, these two moments, so to say, might be a way to look at it. And I was wondering, yeah, if you if you try to trace this linkage in any way or. Thanks, Monica. Anyway, I have more <laughs> issues, but I will stop. Okay. Here. No, I will stop here for now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe uh, this a second round. You can come back if you wish to. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Mia. Do you want to take the question, uh, or do you want Lance to come in? Whatever you feel. I can. I can answer this so long, and then we can. Do okay. Cool. Stuff. Okay. In the, um, so your first kind of question, more about researching the zoo. Um, I can understand the difficulties that you've faced as well. Um, surprisingly, Pretoria, sort of, you deal with the education sector of the zoo when you want to talk about the, you know, the history, and they were quite excited um, for me to come. Uh, but they said that their archives had been moved from the site as somebody, you know, I think somebody part of the zoo was starting to write a, a history of it. And that person had fallen ill, so the documents had all been moved, and they were going to bring it back for me to come and have a look at. Um, I don't have the, the photo with me now to share with you, but when I eventually got to that archive, it's similar to what you said about the flood. 
or it was yeah complete derelict uh, no order a lot of the documents had been you know had been gone under severe water damage um and you know they kind of said like this is this is as good as it's going to get from our side which was extremely disappointing and I kind of thought I'd, I'd have to redirect my research um, entirely. Um, but luckily for this institution, because it was the National Zoological Gardens of South Africa, there is a large portion of, of research that, or documents that I can use to research in the National Archives that were captured, you know, annual reports, letters of correspondence, et cetera, that luckily were stored there and not on site. Um, so that's the way that I've been able to get around the, you know, the, the lack of, of of interest from the zoo and also of their own sort of really badly maintained archive, which is not useful at all. Um, so yeah, I hope that you'll be able to find something like that for you to use. Um, with regards to the linkage between the two, what I find very interesting is that there really isn't uh, any sort of strong linkages between them. It is a long period of time also, you know, between 1959 and 1927, I think, uh, Barnard Harris has, has already passed away by the time Murdoch comes out with his his patent. Um, and yeah, that that this this lack of link is is interesting in this scenario. And what you say is important to try and think about. Yeah, the lack of of that in 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 expanding my discussion with regards to to this. So thank you for that. Um, and yeah, it is also a very paradoxical practice if we think about the fact that. They're capturing these animals to then be put in captivity. So it's you know they're not they're not doing it in order to protect them in, in a larger in a larger framework. So yeah, thank you for your comments and questions, and I'm sure we can chat uh, further. Okay, Lance. Lance, Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah. uh, I just wanted to ask you whether I mean you seem to position a, a Bond Harris as, as a kind of scientific. Uh, practitioner, right? And I'm wondering whether that's perhaps not. That's not true. He, he doesn't belong more in the in the sort of showman, um, the sort of uh, Cherry Kit and Harris type. Uh, was it Kit? I can't remember what his name is. Um, and I, I'm just interested. You, is there actually any evidence that this thing actually did what it claimed to do, other than these photographs, which mm -hmm. are fairly easily staged, right? I mean, there's. So it, it kind of I'm um, I'm interested whether this is actually science or whether this is showmanship. And if it's showmanship, then does it actually? I mean, I think it, it you know the link with with Murdoch and stuff is interesting, but it's interesting in a different way. And I'm just wondering whether the you know if 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 you're going to position an SDS context, whether they whether the, the the question of whether it actually does what it claims to do is is actually quite central to that, or because if it doesn't, then it, it's it's more like you know the lion tamer sticking his head in the lion's mouth, or it's that kind of you know uh, thing. So I'd be interested to hear on you know your thoughts on that, or any of the the documents you've looked at, if they have any if anyone other than him actually verifies that this thing does what it claims to do. Thanks. Um. So yeah, if you understand, I wasn't trying to portray him as a you know scientist at all. He is arguably a very amateur naturalist, um, explorer, yeah, sportsman, um, and definitely there's a large element of showmanship within the way that he is portrayed in the press with regards to it. But if we look at the actual his actual invention and how similar that is to what the modern day tranquilizer gun is and functions as. Um, I don't think it's, it could be easy to discredit that it, it was, you know, use, it did have um, effects that worked. Um, I guess the sources are all popular press sources, and it, it's obviously, I'd have to dig more in order to be certain that it did work, but there are lots of, of, of cases that claim that it did and that they were animals then who revived and, you know, were able to be set free after his experiments. Um, and... So yeah, I'd have to continue investigating that, but I do think that there were times that his bullets definitely worked, but that again, the nature of the chemicals used, which is what Murdoch essentially, you know, transformed in looking at the type of species you're trying to tranquilize, the size and modifying the chemicals to do that, I think was essential in what Harris wasn't able to do um, with his invention. Uh, Teddy, please go ahead. 
Um, thanks, Mia. Um, I, I was just kind of wondering, I mean, your talk is, is focused on the human side of, of this interaction. So I was wondering a little bit more about the animal side of it. Um, but I was also thinking about the, a, a lot of the developments in, in these processes of hunting and the technological development is it's not necessarily about the killing of the animal itself it's about the the necroaesthetics about killing the animal in a way that allows it to be displayed in particular ways and it's actually that trade um, in you know animal skins the display of uh animals in a various in various ways that that is actually driving um many hunters to do what they're doing i mean it's how they're surviving often um, so I, I was kind of wondering, you know, to, to what extent that politics of necro aesthetics and the politics of killing cleanly or, um, you know, um, in a way that does minimal damage to the animal is actually playing a part here. Um, and I was also thinking, I mean, that the other technology that you're obviously displaying in your talk is, um, you know, print and, and newspaper. Um, and Jody Berland has an interesting book that came out probably a couple of years ago now called Virtual Menageries, uh, where she makes an argument around, uh, and I think she uses the term animal emissaries, um, how animals actually played an incredibly important role uh, in the development of a whole range of, of uh, technological expansion in terms of, of communication um, and communication technologies. Um, so I, I was, yeah, it may be a book that you, you, you want to have a look at. It'll probably give you interesting ideas. Thanks. Thanks, Dodo. Can I respond to him quickly? Of course. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, thanks so much, Terry. I'll definitely look into um, Jody's book. I can, I feel like I might have looked at it for my master's, but I haven't in a while. And I think it could be very useful. Um, with regards to the, the killing cleany for, um, like you said, for using animal skins and then obviously displaying them in museums, I think there is definitely a link there that I need to look at. Um, but um, Barnard Harris obviously was aiming not to kill at all and for the animals to then be revived and displayed as live animals within the zoo. Um, and so I think, you know, he was trying to do something very different to what they were doing um, in that regard. And um, yeah, I think the animal side also needs to be more clear with regards to this. I think we could think about the fact that, you know, the tsetse fly is also causing a lot of this sort of control campaigning within the region, and it is allowing for us to overlook, you know, other things that are happening at the time. So I think animals are playing a larger role in us, um, you know, not being able to see sort of other, other instances of of advancements taking place at the time. But I think that I need to create that as a more um, focused lens with regards to my paper, which is, like you said, actually really looking at the, the human interaction at play in the region. Thanks. Sean. Um, thanks very much, Mia. I missed pieces of your presentation, but this my question is maybe a, a speculative question that might uh, come later, but I'm very curious about well, the national park system we now have come accustomed to the last few decades, which is legally and spatially bounding uh, reserves, but the boundary is always a part of a negotiation with where animals can be protected, open the debate, and agricultural sector on the other side of the fence. I mean, I just wonder to what extent is these sort of uh, technological innovations of these people that you're exploring beginning, you know, because it's about a lot of what environmentalists do today was the sand park ranges in move animals out of the agricultural into the protected. Was that the beginnings of thinking about bounded national parks? I mean, I'm just curious what you know. Thanks, Sean. Um, so Sean, the national parks started mu much before we started mobilizing and moving, like I showed in the, in the slide about the 1960s Operation Rhino. Um, yeah. And Jane Carruthers has written so much about this history. So I'm not trying to think that this isn't something that hasn't been done. It has, but um, she's shown that in South Africa, the formation of these parks were not driven at all by conservationist type, you know, movements. Yeah. But we're trying to protect um, 
uh, species of wild game that could then be used by sportsmen to hunt and they would have to pay yeah. for that. So it was yeah. driven by that sort of idea. Um, and it was in constant sort of um, conflict between the domestic livestock and agriculture sector that were worried that the game were causing the Nangan endemic to continue to flourish in the region. So um, that's sort of the, the time period that Harris is there and really sort of large mainstream ideology or conservation practices and thinking really only started in the 1960s um, in South Africa. And then that sort of filtered into, you know, game parks, which had already been established, um, but for very different reasons. I mm -hmm. um, hope that helps answer Thanks. your question. Thank you. Lance, is that a new hand or is that an old hand? I think that's an... Sorry, bad old hand, my bad hand. Okay. Um, other question, comments? I have a question in the meantime. I don't see any hands right now. Uh, thank you, Mia, for the paper. I really, this it's fascinating stuff. Um, I feel like, you know, there's a... It can be pushed a little further, I think. We, I mean, it must seem something more than, than ha that Harris came before. What's the other guy's name? Uh, murder. murder. I mean, that I think a lot of the questions that are asking you to have already pointed this in, in, in many ways that whether it's the human, uh, the human political bit uh, or the animal political bit, uh, I think they can, uh, there are other discourses on which this story can then be glommed onto or actually it's told in con conversation with, which makes it much more than this individual uh, discovery, whether as a showman or as a sci scientist, that in itself is an actual interesting kind of an avenue to explore what Lance was talking about. But this, the, the fact that this was there before the 1950s, which in a way I think is doing disservice to the work that you, are, 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 you have done archivally. Because I was thinking about the Setsi uh, uh, fly. I mean, uh, you've read Mahavunga's, Clapperton Mahavunga's work. So I was wondering if that kind of, uh, if, if the Setsi uh, fly eradication um, in an African indigenous knowledge system that uh, Mahavunga is pointing out, if you can actually come into that conversation with uh, Harris's biography. So then it becomes something much more and for me, much more interesting than just saying Harris came before. I'm not saying that you're saying this, but it can be read that, you know, the argument can be much sharper if it can can it can can exist in the interstices of of different kind of political and scientific discourse. Um, sorry, it's not really a question. It's just a it's, it's yeah. a comment because I felt that it's, it's a, because I really enjoyed the way that you began uh, the conversation around uh, Dum Dum Bullet. And the, 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 the general, you know, the general, how should I put it, the, 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 the paradigm of this knowledge of tranquilizing. Um, I think there is another discourse which you can tap into in the Setsi fly conversation, which is much, much more specific, which then, you know, makes the, makes the argument much sharper than just this before after. And especially in terms of the Southeast Asian world, there's another kind of a tranquil, larger tranquilizing discourse which can come in. So I think it can be... It's very exciting, but it can be expanded in different, it has to exist in the interstices of different other discourses and not just as an individual's biography of who came, who came first and addressing that in the historiography, which I feel is, is not, the, not that important a point, to be honest, uh, if, I, if I make sense. Yes, thank right. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think you're muted and under. Sorry. Questions, final, final questions and comments. Uh, Monica, did, uh, there is, we have two, three minutes left. If, did you want, did you, I thought you had another round of questions if you want. Oh. <laughs> Theory. Uh, Maybe yeah. I can say something related to what you just said. No, I think the bigger conversation, I think Mia sort of pointed out to it, this sort of, uh, concern with animal welfare that is on it's beginning there and it's beginning with ideas of 
self-preservationism. And then this is sort of really the first step. And then Murdoch, the 60s, the 50s and the 60s is another level. And he's sort of, you know, and I think that that would be an interesting, an interesting discussion and how in the history of zoos and this is sort of role of zoos and how wild capture sort of still predominates in the 20s the 30s and then in the 50s and 60s wild capture is not possible anymore and they need to breed the animals and to transport yeah. them and the exchange becomes really interesting and so I think that that would be something that, that me I really sort of um mm. told me with this with this talk and I think yeah relating it to this is uh, Zoo yes. conservation. Sorry. It's Terry, sorry, no, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Terry has a question. I, I'm sorry, Terry, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I, I suppose it's kind of just building on that comment. Just uh, another side of the equation is, is the tranquilizer, of course, helps uh, in the rapid expansion of um, the exotic animal trade. Um, and, and there's a range of, of new books that are coming out on that because um, obviously you don't want a damaged animal. Um, so, so this whole thing of protection and whatever, there, there's a there's a CD underside that um, that's a multi-billion dollar industry that far exceeds anything that zoos are doing or capable of doing. Um, so, so I, yeah, just to say that there's also another side to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I just felt that, you know, if the Mahavungas work particularly, because then what, what happens is you can, you are showing the, 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 the instability of the scientific discourse itself uh, on this side, so-called the binary between African indigenous, you know, systems and, and so there is an instability inscribed in both the systems in their interaction. That, that can come out more 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 sharply I think with this kind of a, with this kind of a work anyway I'll stop and we are almost at the end end of our time uh, if there are no other questions I'm sorry for the noise because it's uh, there's a class <laughs> just next uh, next next in the next room thank you Mia for for an excellent excellent paper and um, yeah and thank you everyone else for for um, for joining us and I am not sure if we are having a seminar next Wednesday. I'll, I'll let everybody know if we, if we have. Otherwise, we'll, we'll meet uh, the week after. Uh, thank you. Thanks, and everyone, for the comments and questions. Thanks, Andrew.